Welcome to the third video in the Git mini series. And this one is all about using Git as a solo developer. And of course, the next video that I'll do will be using Git as a member of a team. Git itself is very much intended for team development. When Linus Torvalds made it, he made it for one specific purpose, and that was to manage all the development on the Linux kernel. But this does not at all mean it's just for teams. It has tons of utility as a solo developer, and that's the sort of stuff we're gonna be focusing on in this video. So let's get started. Without question, the most powerful feature in Git for a solo developer is its ability to jump back to any point in time where you've made a commit and see your project at exactly what it looked like at that point in time. As long as you know the approximate time where your repository looked a certain way, you can just pick a commit that was around that time and just check it out at that period. In a way, you can think of these as checkpoints. These are known working times in the past where your repo was a certain way. There's also a durability element to a Git repository, and this means two things specifically. The first is the fact that because you have a history of everything in the past, you can't really lose anything. So if you were to commit, say, 10 files in the past, and then you were to delete those 10 files in the future, your current state of your repository wouldn't have those 10 files, but if you wanted to recover them, you could simply check out a commit from when those files existed and then retrieve them like that. The second thing in terms of durability is the fact that your repository is very likely to exist in more than one spot. And we'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about centralization of repositories. The next big thing with Git as a solo developer is your ability to organize all of your projects, whether it's locally or remote. Now keep in mind the project organization isn't necessarily a feature of Git in that Git doesn't force you into being organized, for instance, but because of the way it works and because you can have master repositories that are in some remote location, it makes it easy to organize them, especially when they are making tools like GitLab or GitHub where you can have all your repositories right there. Now as a solo developer, the extent to which you want to break out projects into various repositories is entirely up to you. I typically make a new Git repository for any project that is of any meaningful size. I also have a repository called Small Scripts, which I place all of my small scripts in. It also helps to use something like GitLab or GitHub because GitLab and GitHub are tools that kind of sit on top of Git and give you a ton of additional features that aren't necessarily built right into Git. Which is to say that project organization and wikis and issue tracking and all that isn't really a feature of Git. It's a feature of these other tools like GitLab and GitHub. We're going to talk a little bit about open source publishing. Now, open source typically involves other people, but it doesn't have to. So for the purpose of this video, we're going to assume that you are the sole developer of software, but then there may be consumers of your software. Because Git is more or less the standard version control system of 2021, everybody that consumes your software is going to expect it to be as a Git repo. And you know this if you've ever searched for a piece of software and you've came across something on like SourceForge. People that are watching this video right now who are roughly my age or older knows that SourceForge used to be the place where you would put all of your software for publishing. Another reason to publish open source with Git is so you can make use of tags. Now, tags is a thing where you can make a new tag and that tag points to a specific point in the Git history. Now, the tag feature itself is a Git feature. However, the management of tags and allowing people to download software at a particular point in time via the tag is a feature of something like GitHub. So, you know, they have the tags here. You can pick a specific tag and a lot of, a lot of authors, what they'll do is they will version their software for release by using a tag. And this is something you as a solo developer of an open source project would do even if you had nobody else working with you. The next thing you can make use of for a solo developer and also a team developer is branch experimentation. And this is the ability to work on your project in some way and then later decide, I, I don't like what I did and then just discard that work. So working on the same repo from the previous video, I have, remember, my hello.txt and my readme here. I also only have one branch, and that's just the master branch. So I imagine I wanted to do some work, but I wasn't really sure if it was something I wanted to keep. Maybe I'm just experimenting with new features. So I want to make a new file called hello2.txt, but I don't want it to pollute the master branch. Instead, so what I can do is create a new branch, and I can create a new branch and access that branch with one command, git checkout dash b, and then you specify the branch name. So I'll call it like experimentation one. You'll see now when I do git branch, I now have two branches and the asterisk is next to experimentation one, which means that's the branch I'm currently working on. So now I can just do whatever work I wanna do. So I'll make a new file called hello2.txt. I'll put some text in here like, hey, just trying something out. 
I will save that. I'll do git status. You can see where it says uncheck files hello to.txt. At this point, I'll add this file. I'll then commit it saying new file or whatever. And then now I've made a commit to that branch. So what I have now is I have two branches, master and experimentation one. And experimentation one started as a copy of the master branch plus one additional change, the addition of hello2.txt. If we look at the files in our directory, we can see we have indeed hello.txt, hello2.txt, and the readme. Because of the way branches work, switching away to another branch makes the files in your working tree look exactly as it is on that branch. So if I do git checkout master, and then I look at the files in my directory again, you can see that hello2.txt is not there anymore. And that's because hello2.txt is only present on the experimentation one branch. So if you do get branch, you can see that the branch is indeed still there, it's just not checked out. So then imagine you decide at this point, you know what, everything I did on experimentation one branch, it's just junk, it's not the way I wanted it, so I'm just gonna discard it. And all you gotta do at this point is get branch dash D, specify the name of the branch, hit enter. Of course, it's gonna say it's not fully merged. That's because Git won't let you discard content that would cause it to actually go away. But since you wanna actually discard the work, you can switch it to a capital D, and that branch is gone. When I do git branch now, you can see that experimentation one has just disappeared and it's like that work you did was never there. The other great thing about branch experimentation is the ability to put work on hold while you work on other work. So imagine you have a project, you have a master branch and you have a couple experimentation branches, you're doing some work and then there's some high priority need to fix something in the master branch. All you do in that case is commit to your experimentation branch, check out the master branch, do some work, commit to that, and then push it up to wherever you need it to go. Take a second to think how you would do this if you did not have a version control system. So you're just, you're altering a bunch of files, you've done a ton of work, it doesn't really work, it's still broken because you're still working on it, and then you have to change something completely unrelated. How would you do that? And the answer is you'd have to reconcile all that in your mind. You'd have to keep track of which files you are working on as a new feature, and then you, which files you are working on that need to be moved up immediately. The next big solo development thing for Git is centralizing your repositories. And this is where we're gonna end up having a little overlap between solo and team development, but that's okay. For the purpose of these next points, we're gonna assume that this is not open source software. This is closed source software that you're maybe making as a private project, but you need it in several places. A centralized repository really helps with this because it creates a copy of your project that exists somewhere else. This is kind of an implied backup, even though you didn't really intend it to be one. A common pattern that exists for web developers specifically, or anybody that has to deploy their software to a remote machine, is you have a development machine locally, you have a centralized repository, and then you have a remote server which needs to take the current copy of that repository and make it live on some site. Now I wanna make clear that when I say centralized, I'm referring to the master copy of a repository from which all work is pushed to, and then from which all work is pulled from. Having a single centralized master copy of repository makes tons of things very easy, especially when it's accessible at one uniform URI. URI meaning github.com slash realtux slash whatever. This means that setting up new machines to work on the same project is easy, and this means pulling code to remote servers is also very easy, and it's all happening in the same way. Next is something called deployment keys, and although this is not a specific Git feature, this is something that you need to be aware of as a solo developer. So the problem that deployment keys solves for is when you have a remote server that you need to get code to, but it's for a private project. Of course, you working on that project don't have that problem because you're authenticated with whatever server you're doing. You can freely push and pull either because of SSH keys or username and password or however you have it set up. The remote server, on the other hand, even though you own it, cannot access a repository directly. But the remote server doesn't need to make any commits. It doesn't need to get push doesn't need to do any of that. All it needs to do is get clones and get pulls. So the whole point of deploy keys is to authorize an SSH key from the remote server to just make pulls on a particular repository. Now obviously this particular project EMKC is already open source and publicly available so this is kind of pointless but if this were a private repository you could take your SSH public key from the from the remote server that needs to access it. You can insert that here. You can do add key and then this will authorize just that server with that public key to pull this repository down to itself. 
This makes it so some specific user does not have to authenticate on a remote server because that's ultimately what you'd have to do is I would have to take my username and password or my own SSH key and import it into the server. And I wouldn't want to do that, of course. And last but not least is remote pre-deployment diffs. And I'll do a demonstration as to what that is. If you're doing a ton of work on a project and you're getting ready to deploy to your remote server, you may not know exactly the extent to everything that you've changed. And before I deploy new code to my server, I always check exactly what's been changed before I actually apply it to the server. So for this demonstration, I'm actually going to be using a real project that, that we work on. And just for the purpose of this, just assume that I'm doing the work and I'm doing the deployment. So right now there's a pending change that needs to be made. And ordinarily when I go to do a deployment, what I'll do is I'll do git fetch dash dash all. This pulls down all of the branches and updates the tracking branches from my local repository. And this allows me to compare the working tree with what's about to be merged into the working tree. So after I do git fetch all, I would do git diff master origin slash master. Now, obviously nothing's here because there's no pending change, but what this would tell me is the difference between the current working tree and then what is about to be merged in. So for demonstration, I'm going to actually merge in a live feature from the project that we work on, and it's just a single line change. So I'll just, you know, just merge that in now. So now that I have work that's been merged into the master branch that is now ready for pre-deployment, I can do this exact same process. I'll do git fetch dash dash all. You can see now it says something different. It's saying that develop was updated and master was updated. Now when I do git diff master origin master, you can see it has one change there. And this is telling me that when I merge master, it's going to make these changes. So rather than me trying to remember exactly what's been changed, I can just do this. I know exactly what's going to be changed and then I can have confidence to actually apply this change and know it's not going to break anything. And of course there is some overlap here in team development. You know, if the person that did the work, which in this case was somebody else, you know, this would technically be a team development thing, but this works the same for solo development as well. And that's all for the solo development video. Stay tuned for the fourth and final video on team workflows and how to use Git in a team. If you have any questions about anything you saw in this video, please put them below in the comments. Thanks a lot for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Take care.